Almighty Father in heaven, in the name of your Son, our glorious and victorious Savior, Jesus Christ, we humbly ask for your blessing upon our worship of you on this, your holy and sanctified Sabbath day, so that we may grow more in our knowledge of you, our love for you, and our obedience to you. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself, or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. Amen. Today is sermon number 34 in our ongoing and progressing complete Holy Bible reading of the King James translation. We are beginning today Deuteronomy 27. Deuteronomy meaning in English pretty much you may notice the similarity in dual or deuce if you will uh, in that English word uh, meaning second time and Moses was not merely repeating what the original instructions that were given to the Israelites he's now reiterating what was originally given to their parents and grandparents 40 years before to the children and grandchildren of the Exodus because the parents had chosen not to go in they were brought literally to the threshold of the promised land and chose not to go in so the Lord turned them around marched them around in circles for 40 years and now Moses was reiterating what was originally given and given then to the children because most of them would have been if even perhaps some of them weren't even born because over the 40 years there would have been children born so a lot of them hadn't even heard it the first time so for them it was the first time but as for certain it was the first time in which they were accountable for themselves and that was then up to them to do what their parents had failed to do and fortunately they did go in poor Moses by that time uh, I wouldn't say that I don't think he was just ready to die I think he really wanted to cross that river because he cer certainly earned it and but the thing is he I'm sure also realized that despite that disappointment he is going to cross that physical Jordan he's going to cross into the promised land we know he's going to be in the kingdom of God uh, the transfiguration prophecy that vision shows Moses being there so we know he's going to make it but it must have been a hard thing for him to have to put up with all of that what well, was only going to be a one-year journey a little over a year they could have made it if they had gone in but they chose not to so 40 years later here's Moses still out there and unfortunately he himself didn't make it not because of anything other than his own humanity because you can't have one set of rules for the leaders and a set of rules for everybody else it has to be everything and when somebody messes up they pay for it and unfortunately whether done out of frustration I don't think he had any evil intent but I think he was just so frustrated with those people the constant whining constant threats I mean they, they had actually threatened to stone him a number of times they wanted to turn around and go back to Egypt and they were all they were all thirsty so the Lord simply had given instructions to Moses go out there and we'll make the water for them but unfortunately Moses in his frustration and the heat of the moment uh, we know he had a bit of a temper we know that from when he smashed the, the first set of the Ten Commandments, those tables of stone. But he made it sound as though I'm giving you the water. He just didn't give credit where credit was due there, and that's what cost him. And there it was. And unfortunately, but as we said, it, it, it doesn't matter because he did what he had to do, and he's going to get to the one that counts. And that, that's what we're aiming for, too, isn't it? 
We want to get to one, to the one that counts. This life, well, whatever. We do the best we can for as long as we can, and then that's it. You know, we can have a clear conscience despite our imperfections because the imperfections are there. Part of the, actually, part of the imperfection is the fact that we don't live forever in this physical life. We have to be able to pay for our mistakes in this life to, to feel the pain as a learning lesson. And we do, don't we? Hopefully. Some people don't. They wallow in the pain and just sort of make a, a life out of it, and that's unfortunate, but eventually they will come around. Deuteronomy chapter 27. And Moses, with the elders of Israel, commanded the people, saying, Keep all the commandments which I command you this day, and it shall be on the day when you shall pass over Jordan unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt set thee up great stones, and plaster them with plaster, and thou shalt write upon them all the words of this law, when thou art passed over, that thou mayest go in unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, a land that floweth with milk and honey, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee. Therefore it shall be, when ye be gone over Jordan, that ye shall set up these stones, which I command you this day, in Mount Ebal, and thou shalt plaster them with plaster, and there shalt thou build an altar unto the Lord thy God, an altar of stones, which thou shalt not lift up any iron tool upon. Thou shalt build the altar of the Lord thy God of whole stones. Thou shalt offer burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord thy God. Thou shalt offer peace offerings, and thou shalt eat there and rejoice before the Lord thy God. Thou shalt write upon the stones all the words of this law very plainly. And again, the the sacrifices that are there were themselves all symbolic. Even the burnt offerings, you know, what's going to happen? Uh, will the lake of fire, that will be like a giant burnt offering, but it will be a joyous event because at the same time, everyone who wanted, when that happens, when everyone who wanted salvation or wants salvation for themselves will have had the opportunity to have it. And those who have chosen to not be there, well, they're going to get what they want too, and it will be that massive worldwide conflagration, that ocean of fire that is coming, and it will be like a giant bird offering, a giant purification. The only ones that will survive are those who have chosen to do so, by means of salvation having been granted unto them in their spirit. So it isn't a matter of anything that any man-made religion could come up with. Many people think that the what happened out there in the deserts, like the law of Moses or, or the religion of Moses. Well, no, it was the Lord. And who was the Lord? It was Christ. And we'll put the link on for, for the Lord God. If you can understand that one point, you're going to look at the Bible in a very, very different way. And hopefully you're going to realize a lot of the things people say about the Old Testament or the God of the Old Testament, which they say they assume is the Father and that somehow Christ came to undo undo all of the law, which in itself is a blasphemous lie. He would never have done that. The fact that he was sinless proves that he was in itself obedient to everything the Father had done, but it wasn't the Father. He was representing the Father. He was sent by the Father to do what he was given to do. But he didn't undo anything. He didn't do away with the law of God. That's what Satan tried to do. And We hear so many people, I, I hear it constantly, people who say that, well, they're free, they're saved, they're this, they're that. But they're not. You're not until you are. And, you know, as long as you're physical, you're not born again. You're still born, as that was explained in Nicodemus. We put the link on for John 3.16. A verse that is quoted by well-meaning people, perhaps, but no one ever bothers to actually read it. Actually read what's in the chapter, let alone the entire scriptures. Let alone that Old Testament back there with all those do and don't things, well, it was Christ. It always was Christ. Verse 9, And Moses and the priests, the Levites, spake unto all Israel, saying, Take heed and hearken, O Israel, this day thou art become the people of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt therefore obey the voice of the Lord thy God, and do his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day. You know, it doesn't say, do what Moses said. 
do Moses' statutes or Moses' commandments. All Moses was doing was repeating what the Lord told him to do. He was a prophet. And that in itself was probably why people didn't like him. Because prophets generally, as we read throughout the Bible, I don't think there's a single exception there, and it includes Christ himself, prophets come to teach the word of God to people who either accept it or not. And the present time, most of the world doesn't quite want to yet, and so therefore prophets are resented. When all you're doing is reading the word of God. And yeah, God, God's a know-it-all. He knows it all. He knows much better than we do. And there we are. And people eventually will come around to that. There's no matter. You just sort of have to be really patient. It takes, it takes a lot. Some, someday, if I could, I, I, don't, I know I can't because there's a matter of privacy in communication, but I would really like to publish some of the emails that I repeat, received from people who claim to be Christian. The most violent mouth on them. The things that they say. The threats that they make. And it, it just amazes me how they can say that because they're rejecting almost always something that has been quoted from the Word of God. Almost always. I mentioned too, I think, I, I have to correct this now, because I mentioned, I think, even it was even just last week, I said that I've never received a threat from a Muslim. I got one this week. The first one that I, I don't recall any of ever having received one before. And even then, I'm not sure it was a threat, but it was just a quote from the Quran. Uh, I, I don't have it in front of me. That everyone who does not bow before uh, their idea of religion is going to have destruction coming upon them. So I get, was that a threat or just a quote? I don't know. It doesn't matter anyway. But that was the first time I've ever heard from. So I guess we're we're getting out there to the Muslims too a little bit. I wouldn't be afraid of the Muslims. I, I'm not afraid. Of the ones who think they're Christian, those are the scary ones to me. I I was raised as a Catholic, and most of my relatives are still today Catholics. A lot of people think that I'm sort of a religious fanatic. You ought to see some of my Catholic rel. You want to see religious fanatics, but without getting into that. Verse eleven. And Moses charged the people that same day, saying, These shall stand upon Mount Gerizim to bless the people when ye are come over Jordan, Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Joseph and, and Benjamin. And these shall stand upon Mount Ebal to curse Reuben, Gad, and Asher, Zebulun, Dan, Naphtali. And the Levites shall, shall say unto all the men of Israel with a loud voice, Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image, an abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of craftsmen, and putteth it in a secret place, and all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed be he that setteth light by his father or his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say, Amen. And by the way, those two mountains... Uh, depending on the time of year, depending on exactly where they were standing, but if some were standing, half of them, the ones that were on God's side, were standing with the south face, they were in the light, whereas those standing on the opposing mountain were standing on the north face, in the darkness. So you can sort of see these calls, one from the light of the light, and the other from the darkness of the darkness, and the symbolism of it. It would depend on the name, time of year, exactly their positioning at that time, but it, it's the possibility is certainly there for that, and the symbolism would be very much. Verse 18, Cursed be he that maketh the blind to wander out of the way, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that perverteth the judgment of the stranger, fatherless and widow, and all the people shall say, Amen. And by the one way, the one there with the blind, uh, can you imagine anyone deliberately causing a blind person to walk into something or or to do something like that to a blind person. Can you imagine that? Is that all it's talking about, by the way? Christ later on, his reference to the blind leading the blind, he was not talking about physical blindness. He was talking about spiritual blindness. Taking advantage of people who don't know the Bible, and you, you, someone in the world's full of these, they come along claiming to be great religious scholars or Christian scholars or biblical scholars, or they've got some great 
inspiration and they take advantage of people, usually to make merchandise out of them. They're just after their money or they're after a following or both. And it, it's a matter of spiritually as a matter of taking advantage of them. And in fact, usually, of course, the, those who really who do it don't really understand either. Or if they do, they that is that's far so far gone into the the evil territory, knowing deliberate misleading. I mean, that's purely satanic then, because that's exactly what Satan does. Verse twenty: Cursed be he that lieth with his father's wife, because he uncovereth his father's skirt. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that lieth with any man or a beast. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that lieth with his sister, the daughter of his father, or the daughter of his mother. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that lieth with his mother-in-law. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that smiteth his neighbor secretly. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay any an innocent person. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. And all the people shall say, Amen. And to stop there, to deny the word of God is the same as incest or murder. According to this listing, the penalty is the same, just as evil. That is plain. It doesn't have, there isn't, like the Church of Rome has got like little sins and big sins, mortal sins and just regular sins. Well, the Lord doesn't look at it that way. Why should he? Why Why is disobedience? Is it a matter of degree? Do you think it is? The only degree there is, is is a matter of whether you're innocent or not, and whether you repent, even if you aren't. Those who, who are not yet given their calling, they're not going to repent, not in, not in a way that really counts, because they don't really understand that in order to be, repent, you must obey the Lord. And this world right now just just absolutely hates it. Absolutely, it's, it's still as though obeying God is somehow evil, and following Satan's lawless ways is somehow righteous. And it's not. It's just it's amazing how this how convoluted this world has become. But there it is, and such as it is until such time that Christ returns and and heals humanity by means of the Holy Spirit and are able to do it. You know, the apostles, they didn't really understand Christ very well because they hadn't yet the Holy Spirit in great sufficient measure. That didn't come until Pentecost, the so-called birthday of the church. So isn't it amazing that they were able to hang on as they did, the loyalty that they did, with a relatively small amount of Holy Spirit? And it's amazing just the grit that they were able to do that and hang on the way they did. They didn't understand. You know, they, they looked at the Messiah. Peter did. They all did. They looked at Christ as as what the people of Judah to this very day regard the Messiah to be. A human leader is going to restore a kingdom that's going to rule the world, or at least the whole world is going to respect and look to. I mean, that's that's going to happen, but it's not going to be just a mere human king. When they asked the Lord... Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom? And the Lord's response was such that a lot of people think it was just sidestepping the question, but they wouldn't have understood the answer. They didn't yet have the Holy Spirit to really get it. It's the reason Peter's denial, you know, Peter was no coward. He stood, stepped in front of the Lord, between the Lord and the mob, drew his sword and started swinging to defend the king. And when the Lord told him, no, Put down your sword, put it, put it away. We're not going to do that. And just sort of allowed himself to be taken. Peter couldn't understand that. I mean, just imagine if you're typically carnal in this world and you see your commanding officer or your head of state say, no, let's, let's lay down our arms and surrender. I mean, would, would that be a little confusing? Of course it would. And that's what Peter experienced. So they all did. They ran. They weren't running before. Peter, he just didn't know. He was, he denied Christ because he didn't deny the man. He just denied what happened. He, he was in denial of it. And it's understandable. It was a shock. He recovered later on. 
but he didn't fully understand. But what he did, they they had they had the grit. That's the only really the only way of putting it, as a matter of the tenacity to hang on for for what they did, because the love that they had for that man, for their leader, and they did recognize. They saw the miracles. They knew there was more to it, but they just sort of didn't make the connection. They assumed it was going to be then. He was going to lead a great uprising against the Romans, and it didn't happen. Not yet, but it's going to. That Babylon, it's going to happen. Deuteronomy 28, very important chapter of the blessings and curses that will come upon those who truly, upon those who truly obey the Lord. Not merely claiming to, or demanding to be regarded as such, and then while doing one as one pleases, but to actually do it, the commandments of the Lord, and to see what happens, the result. The fruit will be obvious, whether it be very sweet or very bitter. The fruit will be there. And this is the fruit. Chapter 28, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above the nations of the earth. To interject, keep in mind the Lord God is Christ. Verse 2, And all these blessings shall come on thee, and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shalt be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shalt be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies to rise up against thee, to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way, and flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouses, and in all that thou settest thine hand unto, and he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee as an holy people unto himself, as he hath sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God, and walk in his ways. And by the way, the commandments include the fourth one, which is the seventh day Sabbath. Verse 10, And all people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of thee. And the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy ground, in the land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers to give thee. The Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure, the heaven to give the rain upon thy land in his season, and to bless all the work of thine hand, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. To interject there, does that a, can we see a glaring example of that today? With the Western, particularly the Western democratic nations, the trap that people fall into, when politicians stop standing for principles, but merely start standing for ele election or re-election, they start promising things they can't pay for. Don't increase taxes to actually pay for everything that we get ourselves into, so we'll just borrow it and keep borrowing it and keep borrowing it until such time the, the debt can't even, the interest can't even pay. They're actually using now some Western nations, those that haven't, those that haven't totally collapsed, are using borrowed money to pay the interest on borrowed money. Verse 13, And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. Thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath, if that Thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and to do them. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And the curses as well that come from politicians. Actually, last week I received one of the most violent, as in profanity, 
emails that I have ever received from a man who's actually standing for election in, in a major, I won't even name the country, but he's actually running for election. And he, he he's absolutely, the response that he has to biblical principles, and yet he claims to be a Christian. But his Christianity, his version of it. And, and someday, maybe if he's really elected, uh, perhaps I'd like to remind him of that email. But again, I can't publish them because they're, they're regarded as um, private communication. I was hoping that he put it on the Facebook page because that one I wouldn't remove. Some of the other stuff I do remove um, simply because it's like graffiti, you know, painting over graffiti. But anyway, that one I wouldn't. Verse 16, Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shalt thou be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke, in all that thou settest thine hand unto for to do, until thou be destroyed, and thou perish quickly, because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. Now, do you see, people say, well, it's such a harsh God back there in the Old Testament. Well, what's so harsh, harsh about this? Look at the love, the blessings, the, the abundance that was promised and delivered for a time upon those who chose to live according to the principles of the kingdom of God. That's what his people mean. It doesn't mean a people who do as they please and claim his name for themselves. It means a nation of those people whose very laws of God are the constitution as they will be with the God for the constitution of the kingdom of God. It's what it's what's going to get people there as a matter of obeying them, repentance. You know, so if repentance wasn't required there'd be no lake of fire coming. Verse twenty one the Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee until he have consumed thee from off the land, whither thou goest to possess it. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever, and with an inflammation, and with an extreme burning, and with the swords, and with blasting, and with mildew, they shall pursue thee until thou perish. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder, and dust from heaven it shall come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them, and flee seven ways before them, and shalt be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. And to interject, that happened. It happened after Israel was divided into Israel and Judah. It happened. Northern ten tribes, those western and eastern tribes, ironically where Moses himself was buried, was over on those two and a half tribes east of the Jordan, that was the first to go by the Assyrians. It was never recovered. The land of northern Israel, what is today called northern Israel, hasn't been recovered by Israel either, as a matter of the tribes it was given to. The Israel that exists today is actually the kingdom of Judah. We'll put the link on for Israel of Judah. That was never recovered. And the people of Judah, they themselves lost it. They lost it in the time when the Babylonians, about 120 years after Israel was gone, and then they lost it again at the Romans. They lost it again over and over and over again. They lost it to the Ottomans for centuries, about five centuries, until the end of the First World War. The British mandate allowed them to get a foothold again, and we have what we see today. But that's, that's not actually Israel, it's Judah. Verse 26, And thy carcass shall be meat unto all fowls of the air and unto the beasts of the earth, and no man shall fray them away. The Lord will smite thee with the botch of Egypt, and with the emeralds, and with the scab, and with the itch, whereof thou canst not be healed. The Lord shall smite thee with madness, and blindness, and astonishment of heart. And thou shalt grope at noonday, as the blind grope with darkness. And thou shalt not prosper in thy ways, and thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore, and no man shall serve thee. And again, you notice where it says thy ways? the fruit of thy ways rather than the fruit of the winning way because the Lord knows what, what works. He knows 
how humans are best able to function on all levels, and he's given us that ability, that technical manual, if you will, which is the Word of God. Verse 30, Thou shalt betroth a wife, and another man shall lie with her. Thou shalt build an house, and thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and thou shalt not gather the grapes thereof. Thine ox shall be slain before thine eyes, and thou shalt not eat thereof. Thine ass shall be violently taken away from before thy face, and shall not be restored to thee. Thy sheep shall be given unto thine enemies, and thou shalt have none to rescue them. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and thine eyes shall look, and fail with longing for them all the long day, and there shall be no might in thy hand. The fruit of thy land and all thy labor shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and thou shalt only be oppressed and crushed away. Isn't that kind of depressing? But again, it's not the Lord somehow inflicting this upon them. It's the fruit of their own wrong ways. Israel did this to themselves. Judah did this to themselves. The world has done it to themselves. And most particularly the nations that can't claim to be the followers of the Lord are doing it to themselves. This very chapter, when those blessings are there, just waiting for those who want to obey them. So that thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes, which thou shalt see. The Lord shall smite thee in the knees and in the legs with a sore botch that cannot be healed from the sole of thy foot unto the top of thy head. The Lord shall bring thee, and thy king which thou shalt set over thee unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, and there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone. And that, do you have to go anywhere to do that, by the way? To become another nation other than the godly nation? of which the establishment, the foundation of the Word of God, do you really have to go anywhere geographically to become another nation with other gods? Or even when the nation becomes the God, state worship? We read about that in Revelation 13. The mark of the beast, the image of the beast, how Nebuchadnezzar, the original Babylon, and the reason it's called Babylon as well in the end, that great image he set up out there, of those four kingdoms, and then another image, that he set up out there of himself. I think it was of himself. Why would he get, take it so personal otherwise? You notice that as it's recorded in the Bible, it was right after that great prophecy of history. That he was told specifically, you are the head of gold. And in the very next chapter, we're told that Nebuchadnezzar goes, went out and set up this image, this great image of gold. You don't suppose it was of himself, do you? Certainly the possibility, the logic, as it follows, literally as it follows from one chapter to the next, and keeping in mind the original, as it was originally given, there were no chapters. Verse 37, And thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword, byword among all nations, whither thou, Lord, shall lead thee. Thou shalt carry much seed out into the field, and thou shalt gather but little in, for the locust shall consume it. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but shalt neither drink of the wine, nor gather the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. Thou shalt have olive trees throughout all thy coasts, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with the oil, for thine olive tree shall cast his fruit. Thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but thou shalt not enjoy them, for they shall go into captivity. All thy trees and the fruit of thy land shall the locust consume, the stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. And again, the matter of debt. Uh, of, of Rather than actually paying for something and having a society or a nation responsible for its own spending, just promise everything, borrow the money, and send the bill to children and grandchildren. Let them worry about it. Verse 45, Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed, because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. And they shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder and upon thy seed forever. 
because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness and with gladness of heart, for the abundance of all things. Therefore shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send thee, shall send against thee in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in want of all things, and he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck until he have destroyed thee. Thou shalt bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor shew favor to the young. And he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle, and the fruit of thy land, until thou be destroyed, which also shall not leave thee, either corn, wine, or oil, or in the increase of thy kind, or flocks of thy sheep, until he have destroyed thee. You notice that how the curses sort of go on and on. And if you look at how the blessings will come so fast if you start to obey him, whereas the festering wickedness, the refusal to obey, can just go on and on and on and on. Not only as a punishment, because, you know, get God out of our way, get out of our schools, get out of our government, get out of our way. When we need you, we want you to to do whatever we want when we pray to you for our own purposes. But in the rest, you know, rest of the time, just get out of the way. We're, we're here. This is our this is our business. You just don't be telling us what to do. But the Lord let it go on in the hope of repentance. The reason, you know, Israel didn't fall overnight was because the Lord gave them an opportunity to repent. Judah was also given the, that's the reason the prophets were sent. To warn them. And the prophets were hated and mocked and resented because they were told to obey God rather than their own fantasies. And on it went. And if you read the great day of the Lord wrath that is coming, the principle is exactly the same. That will begin the day of the Lord, which is that seventh day, the thousand year day. If it's only gone for that, what is the day of the Lord? Verse 52, And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates until thy high and fenced walls come down, wherein thou trustest, trustest throughout all thy land, and he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all thy land, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. And thou shalt eat of the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons, and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee in the siege, in the straightness wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee so that the man that is tender among you and very delicate, his eye shall be evil toward his brother and toward the wife of his bosom and toward the remnant of his children, which he shall leave, so that he will not give to any of them the flesh of his children, whom he shall eat, because he hath nothing left, him in the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee in all thy gates. That is a horrendous portrayal the depravity in which society, and it, you know, you can read about that in history, you can read about it in today, where war is destroyed, where people are rendered so low as a matter where sin will get you, that these things are not unheard of in the present day. It's what happens when people turn their backs on the Lord. The tender and delicate woman among you which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness, her eye shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom, and toward her son, and toward her daughter, and toward her young one that cometh out from between her feet, and toward her children, which she shall bear, for she shall eat them, for want of all things secretly in the siege, and straightness wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee in thy gates." If thou wilt not observe to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God, then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful, and the plagues of thy seed, even great plagues of long continuance, and sore sicknesses, and of long continuance. Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt, which thou wast afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. Also every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this law, them will the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. And ye shall be left few in number, whereas 
ye were as the stars of heaven for multitude, because thou wouldest not obey the voice of the Lord thy God. Stop. Whose fault is it? All these things. We read in the book of Revelation all those things, those plagues, all those things are going to happen again. What are people going to be doing? Cursing God. They're going to be shaking their fists at God, blaming God for the evil that they have made themselves into. The depravity that they've made themselves into. Verse 63, And it shall come to pass that as the Lord rejoiced over you to do you good and to multiply you, so the Lord will rejoice over you to destroy you and to bring you to naught. And ye shall be plucked from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from one end of the earth even unto the other, and there, shalt serve, there thou shalt serve other gods which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. And among these nations shalt thou find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest, but the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart, and a failing of eyes, and a sorrow of mind. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shalt have none assurance of thy life. In the morning thou shalt say, Would God it were even, and yet even thou shalt say, Would God it were morning. For the fear of thine heart, wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes, which thou shalt see. And the Lord shall bring thee into Egypt again, with ships by the way whereof I spake unto thee, thou shalt see it to no more again, and there ye shall be sold unto your enemies, for bondmen and bondwomen, and no man shall buy you. And again, if you think that's merely the history of Israel, read the book of Revelation in the time prior to Christ's return. It's exactly the same thing. The plagues are exactly the same for the very same reasons. Because keeping in mind all the time, even the great golden calf at the foot of Mount Sinai, you know, they didn't say, no, this isn't the Lord. They said, this is the Lord. They pointed at the calf and said, this is the Lord that brought you out of Egypt. They claimed to be the Lord's people while dancing around that calf, that golden idol. And it's no different. When when Israel and Judah became what they were, they did so in the Lord's name. And in the end time, again, exactly the same thing. The, the, the principle and the result, actually, some of the plagues are exactly the same thing. There is no difference. But it's not the Lord's fault. Because the blessings are there for those who obey Him. Just as the curses are for those who turn away. It's a choice. Deuteronomy chapter 29. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab beside the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. Interesting points there. I'll put on the link for the new covenant just exactly who that was made with as we just read here, but exactly as well that it was Christ. Many people regard the Old and New Covenant as something Christian. Well, it is because the Lord God of Israel and of all of humanity was Christ. Again, we'll put on the link, who is the Lord? Verse 2, And Moses called unto all Israel and said unto them, Ye have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt, unto Pharaoh and unto all his servants, and to all his land, the great temptations which thine eyes have seen, the signs and those great miracles, yet the Lord hath not given you an heart to perceive, and eyes to see, and ears to hear unto this day. And I have led you forty years in the wilderness, your clothes are not waxen old upon you, and thy shoe is not waxen old upon thy foot. You have not eaten bread, neither have you drunk wine or strong drink, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. And when you came Unto this place Sihon the king of Heshbon and Og the king of Bashan came out against us unto battle, and we smote them. And we took their land and gave it for an inheritance unto the Reubenites and to the Gadites and to the half-tribe of Manasseh. And again to interject, they will put on the link for why you see must Manasseh and why, or the interesting speculation of would that have happened otherwise. Number one, if they went in at their first opportunity, which was apparently through the Negev, the southern desert, if they'd gone straight from there as the spies were sent in, and as they had stopped for, would there have been a crossing of the Jordan? 
And as we read here, would there have been eastern two and a half tribes if the other peoples, those other nations, hadn't attacked them, which where they were then defeated by Israel, and Israel took the land. And which, by the way, is today much of that territory in there covers very much a part of what is today the kingdom of Jordan, where Moses is buried. So, Verse 9, Keep therefore the words of this covenant, and do them, that ye may prosper in all ye do, in all that ye do. Ye stand this day, all of you, before the Lord your God, your captains of your tribes, your elders, and your officers, with all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and thy stranger that is in thy camp, from the hewer of thy wood unto the drawer of thy water, that thou sh shouldest enter into covenant with the Lord thy God, and into his oath, which the Lord thy God maketh with thee this day. And to interject there, that was Christ. Continue, 13, verse 13, that he may establish thee to today for a people unto himself, and that he may be unto thee a God, as he hath said unto thee, and as he hath sworn unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And of course the original promise was given to Abraham, the Iraqi, the Iraqi immigrant, who lived in a tent all his life down by Hebron, and Isaac, who continued on the father's promise of the three of them, the least is known about Isaac as a matter of not, he was sort of the middle, the middle one, and then Jacob, who Christ changed, the Messiah changed his name to Israel, with a link on for where Jacob became Israel, and again, ironically, it was in what is today the area of Jordan, it was, it was east of the Jordan, near the Jabbok River. Verse 14, near there with you, only do I make this covenant and this oath, but with him that standeth here with us this day before the Lord our God, and also with him that is not here with us today, for you know ye know how we have dwelt in the land of Egypt, and how we came through the nations which ye passed by, and ye have seen their abominations and their idols, and wood wood and stone, silver and gold, which were among them, lest there be among you man or woman or family or tribe, whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God, to go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there be, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. And it came to pass, when he heareth the words of this curse, that he blessed himself in his heart, saying, I, have, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of mine heart to add drunkenness to thirst. And even the word imagination, as it's rendered in, it's an interesting coincidence, we'll call it that, in which instead of God's nation, they created nations of their own. Imagination, image nation, as in an image of themselves nation, rather than image of God nation, which was the way it was intended, and way ultimately when it's fulfilled will be the kingdom of God, a nation of God's own image, composed of children created in his own image, which was originally a prophecy of creation of man in our own image. Well, God isn't physically human. That was a prophecy in itself, but the physical creation was part one as a means to be able to grant unto those who don't want eternal life, who want to be put to death physically and forever and into oblivion, could could do so. But it's an interesting when that word comes, in, comes through in English, because most of the world today, the nations of the world today, are image nations, re reflections of men and women, people not of God. They're a product of people's imagination. It's an interesting word. Verse 20, The Lord will not spare him, but then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man, and all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him, and the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. And the Lord shall separate him unto evil out of all the tribes of Israel according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in this book of the law. So the generation to come of your children that shall rise up after you, and the stranger that shall come from a far land, shall say, When ye see the plagues of that land, and the sicknesses which the Lord hath laid upon it, and that whole land thereof is brimstone and salt, and burning, that is not sown, that it is not sown, nor beareth, nor any grass groweth therein, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Seboim, which the Lord overthrew in his anger, 
and in his wrath, even all nations shall say, Wherefore hath the Lord done this unto this land? What meaneth the heat of his great anger? Then men shall say, Because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. For they went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods whom they knew not and whom he had not given unto them. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land to bring upon it all the curses that are written in this book. And the Lord rooted them out of his land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is to this day. To interject there, that's a prophecy, isn't it? We're talking here now about when this was written of the Israelites standing within sight of the Jordan River, giving their a reiteration of the law of, and their history, both. And we're talking here about things that happened to them in yet the future. This particular generation didn't do as bad. They crossed. Joshua seemed to hold a very tight control of the nation. I think they had more respect for him than they did for Moses, perhaps because Moses was whatever of a different personality, whereas Mo Joshua may have been regarded as like one of them, one of their own, as a matter of, in that he was of Egypt, whereas Moses, he was raised in the palace, and he was gone for those many years, 40 years out in the desert, when he was with Jethro, out there keeping sheep, out in the Sinai, whereas, because we don't read much of any kind of problems that Joshua had. It began after his death and into the when the period of the judges began things got sort of into the wild west kind of thing again it was just a strong man type of whoever has the most powers is, is the ruler kind of a thing and even that worked for sort of a little while because the lord delivered them a lot of those people like samson and gideon they were given given that means to deliver the israelites from the tr troubles that were inflicted upon them when the Lord simply withdrew his defense of them because Israel as a nation militarily was never really never became stronger than their enemies maybe the ones just immediately next door but it was a big place and they were only one tiny nation and the same thing is true today you know you look at Israel today they're surrounded by many enemies but you know thank God for the for the military industry that has control of so many politicians who keep Israel well armed. And if you think that isn't the way it is, welcome to planet Earth, the way it really is. Verse 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, and that we may do all the works of this law, words of this law. That was a good one. That's good works we shall all do. But they didn't hold on very long. They didn't have the depth yet. And they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. The, the very famous dry bones prophecy of Ezekiel. I'll again put on the link for the New Covenant. They, What rightness they had, what righteousness they had, they did by the sheer grit. Carnal grit, if you will, like a good will, sort of an idea because they did not have a great measure of Holy Spirit. Uh, Moses was given it later on, as was Joshua later on, but before that time they proved themselves. And in Abraham as well, he was, you know, he came out of what is today Iraq. He was an idol worshiper. He was raised in a house of idols. And even when the family made their halfway point stop up there, they resettled up in Syria, they remained idol worshippers. Jacob, or Israel, when he was up there all that time, he was surrounded by idols. One of the reasons, if not the primary reason, that Laban pursued the family was because Rachel stole Laban's idol. And, you know, they carried them away. It took a while, you know, to get rid of all that. They were surrounded by it. And they never really got free. When Israel and, and Judah broke into two nations, divided into two nations, the first thing that was done, the border marker was, or for Israel, were two idols, two calf idols. You know you're entering Israel because there's that idol there, either from the north or the south. And that's what they did. And it brought about their destruction when they did it. They didn't last very long, three centuries. It seems like a long time to a human lifetime, but it's a matter of the overall flow 
of events and the overall direction and the overall destination. It's not really that much. Chapter 30, And it shall come to pass, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath scattered thee. And again, you see, it wasn't just a dead-end wrath, a dead-end destruction, at least not for a long while. It went on and on and on, but it was there. It was delivered unto them. The troubles were allowed unto them. The trouble was actually there. It wasn't a creation. God doesn't create evil. He just protects us from it. And when we choose evil, he doesn't protect us from it, and so therefore the evil happens. Verse 4, If any of thine be driven out unto the most parts of heaven, and from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do thee good, and multiply thee above thy fathers, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart, and the heart of thy seed, to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies, and on them that hate thee, which persecuteth thee. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord, and do all his commandments, which I command thee this day. So again, you see, the purpose of the wrath, the purpose of allowing the evil to happen. Verse 9, And the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thine hand, in the fruit of thy body, and in the fruit of thy cattle, and in the fruit of thy land, for good, for the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good, as he rejoiced over thy fathers. If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law, and if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, for this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven, and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it? Neither is beyond, neither is it beyond the sea, that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us, and bring it unto us that we may hear it? and do it. But the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil, and that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply in the Lord thy God, shalt Bless thee in the land which whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land whither thou passest over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth re record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. Stop. Whose choice is it? Well, it's ours. Who chooses love and life or death and destruction? Answer. We do, by virtue of our choice. The Lord will deliver us unto whatever we want. He is the creator of all good, but part of that good, you know, if we reject him, well then, the good that protects us from all of the things that we don't want to be inflicted, have inflicted upon us, it's a choice. Shaking our fist at God, blaming something on God, and people do that, it's not God's fault. And even when we eventually get sick or get injured or some 
terrible thing happens, as happens to everybody, it isn't God's fault. Even dying is itself a part of the promise of life, because we can't take this, as is explained to that very famous John 3.16, explained to Nicodemus, we can't take this physical body with us. And we don't want it to. You know, we can we can take care of it for a while, but eventually it's going to turn on us. It's going to begin to not work right. It's like an old car. You know, you get a lot of miles on it. It's not built to last forever, and we don't want it to last forever. The kind of body we're going to get, that one's going to last forever, if we choose to accept it. And otherwise, we can just go to the scrap yard, the lake of fire, and and that's it. There's no coming out of that one. But again, it's a choice. No one is going to be in the lake of fire who hasn't chosen to be there. It's a choice. I'll read that again. I call heaven on earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. That thou mayest Love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life, and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land, which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. So, that's a pretty good deal, isn't it? It's not free, as in that we don't have to do anything, and we can't earn it. We're not buying anything. The gospel is free, that knowledge. But the thing is, it's a gift that is given to the Lord's obedient ones. Gifts are free, but you know, gifts are given for a reason, aren't they? It's true. And whether we want the gift is a choice we have to make for ourselves. To make ourselves worthy of that free gift. Can't earn it. Gifts aren't earned but they're given for a reason. And in God's case, for good reason, by obeying Him. Deuteronomy 31. And you notice how real life this is? A lot of people think of the Bible as just some sort of magical, someplace else kind of book. But everything that we read here, can we can very much relate to it, can't we? You don't have to go anywhere as a matter of Seeing exactly what this is right in your own life, right in your own home, right in your own room, wherever you are. Deuteronomy 31. And Moses went and spake these words unto all Israel. And he said unto them, I am an hundred and twenty years old this day. I can no more go out and come in. Also the Lord hath said unto me, Thou shalt not go over this Jordan. The Lord thy God, he will go over before thee, and he will destroy these nations from before thee. And thou shalt possess them, and Joshua, he shall go over before thee, as the Lord hath said. And we'll put on the link for the study, how that transition from Moses and Aaron uh, went to Joshua and Eleazar. Verse 4, And Lord, and the Lord said unto them, as he did to Sihon, and to Og, kings of the Amorites, and unto the land of them, whom he destroyed, and the Lord shall give them up before your face, that ye may do unto them according to all the commandments which I have commanded you. Be strong, and of a good courage, fear not, nor be afraid of them, for the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee, he will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And Moses called unto Joshua, and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong, and of good courage, for thou must go with this people unto the land which the Lord hath sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And you notice there again how he said, go with these people. He didn't say, go with us, go with... He, he, there, there was a distance there, was a separation there. Part of it had to be that way, but the, the upbringing and the separation and such as it was, even though he was a Levite, there was not the closeness that Joshua had. Verse 8, And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee, he will be with thee, he will not fail thee, neither forsake thee, fear not, neither be dismayed. And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Levi, 
which bear the ark, the covenant of the Lord, and to all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the very at the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the feast of tabernacles, when all Israel is come to appear before the Lord thy God, in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. And the debatable point there of where the Feast of Tabernacles is to be held, according to the place the Lord will choose. Um, think about that. Also, by the way, if you look at go to Israel today and see where people observe the Feast of Tabernacles in Israel, throughout Israel, you might be surprised where that is because they build their tabernacle in their own homes, in their own backyards, throughout the land. Because it's the land, the nation, the, the kingdom, keeping in mind the kingdom of God is planetary, it's worldwide, will be figuratively up to then, still is now. Verse 12, Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear, and that they may learn, and fear the Lord your God, and observe all the words of this law, and that their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, as long as ye live in the land whither ye go over Jordan to possess it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thy days approach, that thou must die. Call Joshua, and present yourselves in the tabernacle of the congregation, that I may give him a charge. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tabernacle of the congregation, and the Lord appeared in the tabernacle in a pillar of cloud, and the pillar of the cloud stood over the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go a whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them, and will forsake me and break my covenant, which I have made with them. Stop there. Prophecy bound to happen again, but there's that covenant, and I'll put the link on for that study, because understand who it was who broke the covenant, understand who it was who made the covenant, and you can understand Christianity, the church, the humanity, and how people, humanity, do exactly what is described here in very King James plain English. I'll put the link on that study. Verse 17, Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them, so that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us? And again, you see the point? It isn't a matter of the Lord delivering evil upon them, but as a matter of the Lord delivering us from the evil that surrounds us. Even the, the famous Lord's Prayer states that plainly, directly. And that's really what it is. The Lord is, the, the Satan is lurking. Evil is lurking. Carnality is lurking. It's always there waiting for a chance. And that which delivers us from it is the Word of God. Obedience to it. True obedience to it. Not pseudo-obedience. Not self-righteous obedience. Not imagination obedience. But true obedience. Then the delivery happens. Verse 18, And I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they have wrought, in that they are turned unto other gods. Now therefore write ye this song for you, and teach it the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. For when I shall have brought them into the land which I swear unto their fathers, that floweth with milk and honey, and they have eaten and filled themselves in wax and fat, then will they turn unto other gods and serve them and pro provoke them and break my covenant. And again, the children of Israel, figuratively, it's the way it is as a matter of the descendants of Israel, the descendants of Jacob, children of Israel, descendants, how that terminology was used. But how that they behaved like children, a lot of the cases, simply because they refused to obey what they were given by their Creator. Verse 21, And it shall come to pass, when many evils and troubles are befallen them, that the song shall testify against them as a witness, 
for it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of their seed, for I know their imagination, which they go about even now, before I brought them into the land which I swear. And again, to see the interestingness of that word. He was going into the nation that God gave to them, but they were going to create an image nation of themselves. Verse 22, Moses therefore wrote this song the same day and taught it the children of Israel. And he gave Joshua the son of Nun a charge and said, Be strong and of a good courage, for thou shalt bring the children of Israel into the land, which I swear unto them, and I will be with thee. And it came to pass, when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book, until they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites, which bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law, and put it in the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. For I know thy rebellion, thy stiff neck. Behold, why I am yet alive with you this day. Ye have been rebellious against the Lord. How much more after my death? Gather unto me all the elders of your tribes, and your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears, and call heaven and earth to record against them. For I know that after my death ye will utterly corrupt yourselves, and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. And evil will befall you in the latter days, because ye will do evil in the sight of the Lord, to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. And Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song, Till they were ended. So it was like a national warning, national song, sort of a theme song of what would happen to them if they turned away from the Lord. But look what the difference was. Did they remember the song? Or if they did, they like perverted it into something else. Chapter 32 Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, as in the showers upon the grass. Because I will publish the name of the Lord, describe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is he. They have corrupted themselves, their spot is not the spot of his children, they are a perverse and crooked generation. Do ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people, and unwise? Is not he thy father that hath bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? And that's what I was talking about before, how they ended up going off and becoming something, or some someone and something, that they weren't. They were not true to what they were given. The word patriotism in itself means faithful to the Father. And how even the word king and the kingdom of God, the word king comes from the word kin. It again, goes right back to father. It's like a kings, the original kings, were the heads of families. They were like the father. The patriotism literally means the same thing as the head of the family, which was the king, a word which meant kin. And again, do you see that in the kingdom of God? It's going to be the Father. And everyone is going to be patriotic to the Father, who is the founder of his country, which is a kingdom of God, and the Constitution will be his law. And those who are born, and it won't be just a matter of you know, people moving today can move from one country to another, but everybody's going to be natural born citizens of the kingdom of God. That's what king being born again truly means. Verse 7, Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will shew thee thy elders, and they will tell thee when the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance. When he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land, in the waste, howling wilderness, he led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings, so the Lord alone did lead them, and there was no strange God with him. 
He made them he made him ride on the high places of the earth, that he might eat the increase of the fields, and he made him to suck honey out of the rock, and oil out of the flinty rock, butter of kine and milk of sheep, with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan, and goats with the fat of kidneys and wheat, and thou sh didst drink the pure blood of the grape. But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked, thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. And again, we'll put on the link for who is the Lord, because that rock was Christ. Plainly stated, at the time of the Exodus, and before, and ever since. Verse 16, they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations provoked they him to anger, they sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art mindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And by the way, the one who sent me the, the uh, quote from the Koran should look at the verses of who originally wrote what was written because Muhammad lived about five centuries after Christ and many centuries later after the scriptures that he read to come to the understanding that he claimed to be a prophet of the people of Israel and the people of Christianity and all the rest of it and when they didn't accept it he went off and made his own religion so in that sense they did exactly the Muslims have done exactly what the Christians Christian professing world have done they didn't like what was originally written because it didn't suit themselves so they went off and did something else and just hijacked the word or sort of hijacked God really expecting him to be there like a trained seal but it's not going to happen the time will come that's going to be really obvious verse 19 and when the Lord saw it he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters and he said I will hide my face from them I will see what their end shall be for they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn under the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap mischiefs upon them, and will spend mine arrows upon them. They shall be burnt with hunger, and devoured with burning heat, and with bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of the beasts upon them, with the poison of serpents and of dust. The sword without and terror within shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling also the man of gray hairs. I said I would scatter them into corners. I would make them the remembrance of them to cease from among them. Were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries should behave themselves strangely, and lest they should say, Our hand is high, and the Lord hath not done all this, for they are a nation void of counsel. Neither is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise! that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. How should one chase a thousand, and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock had sold them, and the Lord had shut them up? For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom, and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons, and the cruel venom of asps. Is not this laid up in store with me, and sealed up among my treasures? To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. Stop there. Keep in mind this is Christ's talk. He is the Lord God. Not only was, but is. Verse 36, For the Lord shall judge his people, and repent himself for his servants, 
when he seeth that their power is gone, and there is none shut up or left. And he shall say, Where are their gods, their rock in whom they trusted, which did eat the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offerings? Let them rise up and help you, and be your protection. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. If I wet my glittering sword, and mine hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to mine enemies, and will reward them that hate me. I will make mine arrows drunk with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh, and that which the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning of revengers upon the enemy. Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants, and will render vengeance to his adversaries, and will be merciful unto his hand and to his people. And Moses came and spake all the words of the song, keeping in mind it's a song, in the ears of the people, he and Hoshea the son of Nun. And Moses made an end of speaking all these words to all Israel, and he said unto them, Set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe to do, all the words of this law. For it is not a vain thing for you, because it is your life. And through this thing ye shall prolong your days in the land, whether ye go over Jordan to possess it. And the Lord spake unto Moses that selfsame day, saying, Get thee up into this mountain, Abiram, unto Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, that is over against Jericho, and behold the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel for a possession, and die in the mount, whither thou goest up, and be gathered unto thy people, as Aaron thy brother did in Mount Hor, was gathered to unto his people, because ye trespassed against me, in the children of Israel in the, at the waters of Meribah Kadesh, in, a, in the wilderness of Zin, because ye sanctified me not in the midst of the children of Israel. Yet thou shalt see the land before thee, but thou shalt not go thither unto the land which I gave the children of Israel. And as we said, there was Moses so close, but so far he was up, he could actually see Jericho, actually all the land beyond it once he got up onto Mount Nebo. But he was never cro he never crossed into that physical land, although he was again, as we said, he was buried within somewhere within the eastern tribal two and a half tribes over there, so he was in the promised land, but that wasn't the original plan apparently for them to be over there. It was accepted, but it was not the original plan. But there he was, and yet we know from, for example, the Transfiguration that he's going to be in the kingdom of God. So he died. He went up on that mountain, very sudden death. He died. But from the instant of his blacking out, his next split second of consciousness will be this giant whoosh rising from the dead, along with everybody else all around the world, rise that first resurrection to meet the Lord in the air. He's going to get an even nicer view of the promised land at that time, which will be all the earth, and then he's going to descend along with everybody else. And that includes you. You'll be there along with Moses and everybody else throughout all that time if you do what the Lord said if you choose to be there in that first resurrection or if you're alive that day if it happens within our lifetime then instantly change but the result's the same to meet the Lord in the air we'll link on for those resurrections the harvest prophecies the Bible is a very real book it's a very easy book to understand if, once you realize that it is a real book it's not just some hocus pocus religion some man made thing that somebody was given in a in a cave somewhere that they think, uh, whatever. It wasn't like that. People lived it. They were given the real life lessons in how if you don't follow it, you're going to have yourself a hard time that you just bring upon yourself. Because the Lord delivers us from the evil by means of the word of the Lord that he gave us as his gift of eternal life. Thank you for joining us for services this week. As always, your being with us makes our joy complete. Until next week when we meet again on this God's holy Sabbath day, may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. 
May the Lord make his face shine upon thee, and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee, and give thee peace. God bless you all.